Welcome to Householders, a conversation about American life as Zen practice. I'm Inga Annie Wade. And I'm Kyosaku John Mitchell, and we're lay members of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center. This weekend, I went with my family to a Jewish summer camp, the camp that I actually went to as a kid uh, in North Georgia, for a retreat model called Limud Fest, which is, it's right there in the name. Limud means study. It's it's a learning gathering. That's, that is how Jewish people do retreat spiritual practice as they go to a beautiful place and they spend the whole time like in lectures talking about texts. Uh, but there are services and stuff. Uh, and, and I, and I don't mean, mean to make it sound boring, like generally speaking, it is boring, but Limud is an amazing model that has lots of music and the, uh, the learning, the, the subjects are always offbeat. They're not like, uh, you know, professional Jews. Most of the time, the people teaching, they're just like, participants in the festival who know What's about a professional something interesting. Jew, like a, like a rabbi or educator, uh, who okay. has like books about stuff that they're, they're teaching about. Um, it's, it's, it's all, I mean, a lot of them are rabbis, but it's, but the, the talk, the subjects of the talk, uh, are always like very contemporary and they're, they're also usually generally side projects like even if somebody is an academic or something they're there to talk about some obsessive personal interest of theirs not necessarily like the thing that they lecture about all day so there's a book full of really interesting things to learn uh and it happens in a group they're informal there's lots of back and forth in these discussions and they're self-selecting based on you know sort of what kinds of stuff you're interested in so they tend to be pretty good um but that wasn't, I mean, I only got to go to one talk because we were there with our kids and, uh, my wife was also leading some stuff. So, you know, I was, I was back up a lot of the time, but we went to some of the musical services on Shabbat and they were really fun and there were like enough drums for everyone Mm -hmm. and the food was great. And the, uh, you know, just the, the, even though the people were kind of from all over the Southeast. So we met a lot of people, but there were also a fair number of Atlanta area people, um, lots of whom we needed to get to know better. And this was not a great opportunity for it. Uh, and why am I telling you all of this? Oh, and I also, I got like a pretty decent chunk of time in the morning, uh, to do my personal practice. So I was doing Qigong and Zazen while the baby was napping. And there were people there with yoga mats you know there was a there was an organized saturday morning yoga class so there was a little bit of you know embodied spiritual practice happening um could be more obviously like i could talk about the things that i wish limu did a little bit better but really the reason why i'm bringing all this up with you is because this was an awesome thing and it was for everyone yeah. uh, of all ages and uh, Buddhist communities don't do this as far as I am aware. You know, there's lots yeah. of retreats, but they're not for, you know, I couldn't bring my kids to them, you know? Yeah. I mean, right. It's hard to get a child to sit Zazen all day. That would, it's hard to get an adult to do that. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really, you, yeah. I mean, that's something that I think, as far as like why there's not as many women at the Zendo. Mm. It's like if if you have a child you need to take care of, there's really nowhere for that child to go. And you have that this problem. Yep. I mean, you you don't have like there's no like child care like at the Zendo for us to like take advantage of. Um, and that does make it less family oriented. And I, I think that it can make it also less female oriented um, at the same time. Yeah. And um, we have had a few things that, that was for families. I know that we had like an art show and there was like music. Sensei was selling some of his artwork. There was a couple of other artists there. So, yeah, it has it has happened, just not not in a very um, large quantity. Yeah, I mean, part of what's hard about something like I'm describing this like large scale multi day thing is how is the incredible. I mean, it's like people's full time jobs to plan it, and so there's a there's right. a, there's an institutional problem there 
And the thing about Limud is that it is actually a dedicated organization. It's not like it's affiliated with a particular congregation or something or even denomination. In fact, that's sort of the point is that it's pluralistic. It's for people of all kinds of Jewish backgrounds and levels of interest and participation. And that's what makes it possible is that there's this coordinated effort uh, um, across a bunch of different communities to make sure that uh, this thing is awesome and well-programmed and well-supported. And so there's infrastructure missing if that's the kind of, if we want to do something like that. But I don't really see it as a priority either. And I don't just mean like family oriented things. I mean, the idea that gathering and community building is, is the thing to commit the most resources to. And, and maybe there's maybe the role of a Zen center or a Zen Sangha is not conceived that way. It's conceived as a support for practice. And there is and there is a householder way to do that, which is support people in figuring out ways to have a you know dedicated daily practice that they can bring back into the rest of their lives and the rest of their community and stuff, and let this just be a place for people who have that as an affinity with each other, that particular practice. And so it's a smaller slice of life. But I don't see how I don't see any reason it should be that way. And I don't really think I mean, maybe my ideas of what a sangha should be are formed by my ideas of what a Jewish congregation should be. Mm -hmm. But a Jewish congregation is basically an extended family that does as much stuff as possible together. And Mm -hmm. this this kind of programming is an example. And that has its downsides, too, to be sure. But, you know, I feel like it, uh, it, it, th- there's, I can see no downside to doing more stuff as a sangha that feels yeah. community first as its priority. Well, let, let me tell you some of the other things that you might not be familiar with because you joined like during COVID. <laughs> when we there, literally there were... <laughs> couldn't be in the same place as each other. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that does complicate things. There were more things. Actually, once a month we would have a gathering and eat together on um, after the Sunday service. And Mm. um, that was actually a lot of fun. And we always had a a great time. It was sort of, it wasn't really like a board meeting, but we did kind of openly sort of discuss some of the things, some ideas about what we wanted to hear or see or whatever, but just sitting around at the same table together and, um, you know, enjoying each other's company is really mm-hmm. nice. There's there's a lot of times where we just go out to eat together, like after service. If we have like a guest speaker, we're like, let's go to like the the, the Asian restaurant that's really close to the Zendo and eat together. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, then then there's stuff outside of it where I've I've hung out with people from the Zendo, and I mean, um, you, Amy, and you know, lots of other people I've hung out outside. So. Um, that's not something I would do ever with people from church. Yeah. I mean, I think they want to cultivate that, but I, I don't think I fit in. So I wasn't really right. <laughs> the person that was doing it. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that there are efforts to make it more of a community thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we just have so, some problems and this is just kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of it, but we are a community of people who are um, volunteering their yeah. their time and efforts. We don't have the kind of finances that most uh, religious organizations do. Yeah. Uh, Buddhism only makes like maybe less than 2% of the U.S. population. So finding people who are Buddhists, like we have to, we have had to expand across the United States and into North America to even get enough people to make a Sangha. You know, it's it's different. Like there's probably I would imagine there's more Jewish people than Buddhists. I think it is actually around two percent also. But uh, it's it's clearly a different situation regardless because uh, of how differently uh, they're organized. And also the Buddhist community in America is like half people who have only been Buddhists for, uh, you know, like 20 years uh, or less. Yeah, most of them, most of them probably have adopted Buddhism. And the, but there are like, there's a, a Chan temple in Atlanta and they're um, mostly Chinese people. 
who go there. So I imagine they probably, a lot of them probably had been Buddhists from the time they were born, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what that would be like. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I wonder if it's like 50, 50 or if it's actually more, uh, you know, native Buddhists in America than converts, but it's, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, in a sangha like ours, at least, like, you know, regardless of proportion, like we're clearly new at this. Um, so according to the Pew uh, Research Center, which is like sort of the foremost uh, organization that studies this kind of thing, uh, the Jewish population in the United States is 2% and the Buddhist population is 1%. Uh, See, that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's twice as much. So <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It is twice as much. And then it also says that um, about two-thirds of U.S. Buddhists are Asian Americans. Yeah, two-thirds. That's That makes sense. So the other third is just uh, white people and black people and other people that just adopted it. Yep. Right. And so there's, yeah, there's, there's a question of like, how do you even formulate community in an elective religious community like that like in the part of the thing you know because like the thing you said about fitting in like i don't really socially fit in very well with the people at lemud either but culturally i obviously do and i felt comfortable i i you know i i had to, i had to deal with my outsider feelings but purely as a matter of like temperament you know i didn't feel mm -hmm. excluded by basis of like not actually knowing what people were talking about or knowing the the lingo or the dance moves or whatever uh and the in a in a sangha like ours that's like mostly converts uh the situation is clearly that like our families don't actually participate in this uh so it's like you know by and large so the uh the idea of dragging them along to some weekend thing where we all meditate in the mornings and you know learn together later like that's not something that people will be interested in doing but but at the same time like I, this, the thing that we did at Limud, you know, though obviously a lot of people are there to do, to like participate heavily and learn and, uh, you know, do Jewish active, like explicitly Jewish activities, a fair number of people, even the people who weren't just like exhausted by their children the entire time, like, like we were, uh, a fair number of them were just there to hang out in this summer camp environment and just chill and do communal stuff together. And part of me wonders whether an effort to organize something like that in the same kind of overarching way where like we got in touch with all of the Buddhist organizations in Atlanta and said, let's rent out a summer camp and like COVID test everyone when we get there. That that's I should have probably mentioned that. We all had to show yeah. a, a PCR test result, negative PCR test result within 48 hours of the uh, retreat starting and then they did rapid tests on every person in every car when we got there so there was like a certainty that nobody there had covid and it was actually kind of an enormous relief I mean, we're still wearing masks and stuff but the the uh the energy was very chill and so you know the idea of doing that even just as a relief from circumstances gathering a bunch of different people from communities that don't know each other at some summer mm -hmm. camp and just like having yoga and meditation and qigong and tai chi yeah. and you know art and music and uh you know sure there can be this some summer camp exists hmm? uh, it just doesn't i think it's mainly the tibetan buddhist temple the uh, yeah yeah uh, drepung i forgot what is the, the yeah the drepung lufling yeah Lufling, uh temple in atlanta yeah and they have a summer camp uh -huh. um and you know i think it's just like i don't know how long it is not super long but Maybe like a week or something like that. Uh, and it is very family oriented. Um, so, I mean, if, if we did like team up with uh, someone like the, the Drepung Sling to add on to that, it would be interesting. Is that Hard Labor Creek? Um, and it's very family oriented. Yeah. So much so I was like, I don't know if I am going to fit in. Just like I don't have a family. Like it seems kind of weird that I'd be going. Oh. But, you know. Did you go? No, oh. no, I was look. I looked it up though. It was um fairly affordable and looked fun. Yeah, so I feel like I feel like if you get a critical mass of like three different kinds of Buddhism, then it becomes like a truly pure pluralistic thing, and has this sort of friendly atmosphere of like you know the the 
the crimson robe people and the yellow robe people and the black robe people. And it isn't like some sort of religious gathering, but it's actually just kind of like a festival. And then, you know, the, the, you do have to have different tracks for different people in order for this to be successful. Cause Limud is an all ages thing too. And there's stuff for old people and there's stuff for like single 20 somethings and there's stuff for parents with kids and there's stuff for the kids by themselves, little kids and big kids, you know, like the, the big kids spent most of this weekend canoeing around the lake and oh, nice. you know like my and my kids were in uh the one air conditioned sort of like nice cabin with two masked professionals and a bunch of toys you know uh so the it, obviously like this was a pretty well resourced thing and the, you know if we were whipping something up for the atlanta buddhist community it would be a little bit more shoestring and probably involve a lot more volunteer labor but like what I've been thinking about since I got back is how much intangible value that gathering created just for the people in Atlanta, including us that are, that haven't gotten to spend time with each other or spend that much time with each other in that kind of capacity, like how much more we're going to do, uh, you know, just by sort of starting from this point, next time we see each other, uh, having had this kind of cool weekend of, relaxing and and dreaming of the kind of jewish community we want to have you know this it, it it i feel like it catalyzes much more interesting stuff and 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 it and maybe this is t- turning a corner on sort of what we're actually talking about but i don't really feel like just sustaining normal zen practice is enough of an agenda for a sangha for my sangha to have, like, I I want more out of it, um, as a purpose, a sense of purpose than just like maintenance of my Zen practice. And I'm not talking about some kind of activist agenda. I'm talking, although it inevitably kind of becomes one when you start talking about like Mm -hmm. our way of life needs to change, but there's so much about, in my opinion, from my perspective, so much about Zen practice in our circumstances as like a society is just about dealing with stuff that is harmful and, and, and distracting and upsetting and overwhelming and terrifying and coping with it through, you know, practice and equanimity and acceptance. And, and I, I kind of want more out of it than that in terms of building the world that we want to be in that supports, uh, you know, not just this practice, but like the practice as a way of life and a set of values. And again, I'm not talking about like marching and waving signs. I'm talking about living near one another and taking care of each other and, you know, like, educating our children together you know like i'm ter- like i'm so yeah. over this model of education that we're that we're kind of the that's kind of the only option in our society it's like such a dangerous covid situation and my kids are you know just not thriving in it and you know jews provide their children an alternative educational system and it's very expensive and has lots of drawbacks but you know what if we had an educational system that taught kids uh, the kind of practice that we do and help them use it to adjust to circumstances instead of whatever, you know, pet education theory, you know, kindergartens are using. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot to ask. It's a, it's especially of, as you said, a community that's kind of just responsible for itself and, you know, barely has enough money to pay anyone anything ever uh, to do any of this work. But how much value could we get out of just like one gathering where this was the ambition? Yeah, and this would have to be different from our usual gatherings, which are the retreats and conferences that we do bi-yearly. 
um, and the Just It Saturdays, like, because those are, you know, rather focused on meditation and sitting. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's not that we wouldn't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it does seem like, you know, just coming from the perspective where I kind of know what was, what's all involved with, uh, planning those conferences to begin with. And I think something like this would be much harder, Uh which could just, like you said, like people are kind of hired to plan something of that scale and, you know, we're already, I don't, I don't want to say struggling. I don't think we're struggling to do the, um, you know, to plan the conferences, but you know, it, it still takes a lot of effort and, um, and planning and everything. So, um, it, I think it, I think it is important and I do hope that we kind of can spearhead something like this to bring the community to together again. Um, and I think, you know, this is just the struggle we have throughout the organization as a whole is just capacity, yeah. you know? Yeah. Capacity is sort of the struggle for the whole species. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I've, I'm, and I'm, you know, I have a, I have a history of event planning in my career also, and definitely agree with your assessment what I'm saying, though, about Limud is that it was capacity building in a long term sense for the participants. Like yeah. there's a cl- huge sacrifice made by the organizers of something that awesome. The more awesome mm-hmm. your event is, the worse it is to organize. That's just sort of like a law of physics. Right. And so the organizers of this barely got to participate in the way that the participants did. But that's something that you do if you're, if an, if your goal, if the outcome that you want is for the people to come at, that who participate in it to come out activated to do more, and that's the thing that I want to know. I want to know what would happen to our sangha if we were put through an experience that made us want. Uh, that, that activated us that way in terms of our long-term goals and visions, not just like present moment stuff, but how, how do we, uh, how do we build the capacity around us to sustain the kind of life and values that we are here standing up for instead of making it this constant struggle against the situation outside the door of the Zendo. And I guess I just don't have enough of a coherent vision of what that would look like to articulate it. And childcare is the first like specific example that I came up with, but, but there's, there's, there is, there is a, you're right that the problem is capacity. And what I am looking for is the way out of that problem, how to build a bigger capacity around us so that we can grow into it. Cause, cause just asking people to give more doesn't do it. Asking people to just no. like turn up their monthly donation or show up for more hours of sweeping like that, that is, or fix the roof, you know, like that, that is just, that's just sustaining the current capacity. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there, there needs to be something, uh, There needs to be a gift of strength and energy to the community to to raise their their like baseline capacity to show up. And I feel like there's no better gift than a sort of whole life experience like like that we had this weekend. It's one of the things that's the best things about Judaism to me is. Mm not just the community part, but like Shabbat itself as an idea. Like we have full moon holidays in Soto Zen that we observe in various ways. And there's, you know, we don't have that strong of an observance in our Sangha, you know, like at a Japanese monastery, like those are huge festivals with special stuff to do. And that's part of what I'm talking about. But Shabbat 
as a concept has this protective boundary around the day, around the time from sunset on Friday until the stars come out on Saturday night, you're in this special zone where, where like just being present is, is the only job to do. And it creates this opportunity kind of every week to just be with your family and community and imagine if life were like this all the time. And we just don't have anything that comprehensive in our practice. We just sort of say Zazen should be all the time and you do it in a concentrated way to learn how to do it in every action that you take. And then there you go. You just sort of like carry your internal meditation cushion with you around and that's how you live a Zen life. Well, do you think it's something to do with the actual Zen practice or like you were saying, like, well, there might be other monasteries or um, temples around here that actually do celebrate you know, these holidays in a, in a bigger capacity with uh, more community involvement? Um, or is it just like an, a, an us problem because we struggle to maintain a lot of the time? I think it's closer to the latter because I don't all, I also don't think you need some overt religious excuse to have an experience like that. You know, there's community ones all the time, like fall festivals. And, uh, you know, we had before COVID, even in my neighborhood, we'd have like food truck Thursdays and everybody would go out and hang out and have a good time. Yeah. Food truck Thursdays is a perfect example of the level of seriousness that I that I think is the minimum requirement for something like this. It's not it it doesn't have to have like just like the Shabbat like I used Shabbat as my example and that has such like strict religious connotations. But that's not what this was like at Limud. It was a bunch of adults at summer camp. It was like the goofiest, silliest, most fun thing ever. And when the observance of religious law about Shabbat was not very strict. So, you know, that's, that's not what I, that's not what I mean. What I mean is we need, we, we just need to get together. And I think that the struggling to maintain is, 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 is kind of creating this negative feedback loop of energy. And, you know, I wonder how, I wonder just like what could spark the, desire to to gather and have fun uh it doesn't it doesn't seem like it should be this hard well covid aside yeah i don't think it is that hard i think we could you know get together like i said we have done things in the past and you know we gotta we gotta pick up momentum again you know i i think you are coming from the perspective of COVID, which is not over yet. And it does seem to be still a problem. Yeah. Um, but once it is over and I, I, I'm even at a place where I'm like, I don't know if I should go back to the Zendo. Yeah. I think I'm stopping for the time being because, you know, p- people with autoimmune disorders, like they don't, the, the vaccines don't work as well. Yeah. Uh, any vaccine. It's not just this one in particular. Right. Um, because I guess my immune response isn't as active. I, I think that makes sense. But yeah. Um, so I don't know. And, and but when we do, we have to like we have to go full force when we're when we're allowed to and capable and not like harming people and the way of doing it. And we need to like pick up the momentum of what we used to do and then and go even further. Mm-hmm. But I think it's possible. And I think we we do have the energy to do it. Um, but we are in sort of a slump right now. Yeah. It's encouraging to hear you say that you feel that that energy is there. And you're absolutely right that I've just not been in this community at a time when that energy could really be expressed. And even though I just came back from a very high energy got religious gathering, like the amount of preparation and precaution that it was required in order to make that possible. It's just like not something you can start from zero with. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, it's, it definitely has to be uh, a, when we, when we get back kind of thing and who knows when that will be. Yeah. Like I, I'm also 
not so sure about going back to the Zendo in person anytime soon. Um, just been thinking about my kids a lot. Yeah, of course. And, and like, you know, a couple people was one thing, but you know, last time I was there, there were like seven or eight people in there and, you know, I felt I was nervous and distracted the whole time. So anyway, I, I, I think that I like this sort of, we have to do it with full force spirit that you just shared. And I, I just hope that that's what's building up in all of us because of the frustration inherent in what's happening this in the last year and a half that we're gonna come out the other side someday in terms of gathering together again and i hope that we just really take this opportunity to uh, to to wipe the slate clean as far as what used to be normal uh as Mm -hmm. uh, as in terms of gathering together in community and use that as an opportunity to start from a much higher place I think that the, you know, COVID, the pandemic, like it's not all been bad. You know, mm-hmm. I think that it's it's given us an opportunity to gather as a greater sangha that we never had before because we've had to do it. Yeah. We've had to involve everybody in in North America and and beyond to be a part of what we have. And so now we actually have more um we have more involvement than ever before. And Mm -hmm. I think people are really going to be dying to come in, in a physical way and come together. Um, But we don't have an opportunity for that yet, but I think, I think that it's coming. And I think that in the future, since we have more support than ever before, it will probably be bigger than ever before too. Householders is a production of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Silent Thunder Order. Find us on the web at azzc.org. Our sangha depends on your support. You can donate by PayPal to donate at storder.org. Gasho.